The Unshackled Waves, episode 108. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. As you know on the Unshackled Waves, we like to introduce you to other alt media personalities who are doing their bit in this battle we are in against the regressive left. Today we'll be chatting to Luke Isaac, who runs the YouTube channel That Guy Media. It features his interview series Old Speak, where, like this show, it features interviews with other media personalities and activists. Luke has a background in music and music promotion, so he knows a thing or two about uh, media and promotion. Luke, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, thanks. Now, I thought we'd start, uh, both of us probably, I'll say, five, ten years ago, never thought that uh, we'd have this uh, career in uh, alt media. There, For each of us, there was always... <laughs> A, a moment uh, where you know we felt you know compelled to to enter this uh, scene um, you I've seen you on your show call it a red pill moment so uh, I'll ask you to explain <laughs> what's yours oh gosh how do we do this um, without implicating other people for me I grew up an arch conservative okay I um, uh, from 2001 I, I was doing a uh, Straight out of school, I was doing a liberal uh, or advanced diploma in liberal arts at the time, um, and 9/11 happened, and so it was one of those things that I bought the narrative. I wrote way too many column inches to uh, to be proud of supporting the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq after that, and um, I was on that road for for a good five years until uh, one of my sources basically said, and then another within the space of three months, we're not helping you anymore. Um, uh, they were deep sources in the US, and uh, the, and I didn't understand why. They said, unless you get over this disnified fairy tale of, uh, of what you think about this war, um, we can't help you. Uh, within the week, I had a couple of hundred pages dropped into a, a secure Dropbox, and um, the whole rug had been ripped out from under me. I realized... Um, well, I went into depression for about six months, and I realized that if I was wrong about that, I was wrong about so many more things. You know, the way I thought about other people, the way I thought about, about other nations. Um, and, you know, I had avoided tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists like the plague, you know, my whole life. Like, I really hated the idea of uh, anybody questioning the mainstream media narrative because it was so good and virtuous and right. Um, but, yeah, look, between that time um the, you know i won't say i swung hard left but i i started seeing the other side of things you know um so from bolt to pilger in a sense um that red pill moment just as they do it, it, it just uh you you become more open to more things after you get over the the um life destroying depression of the whole thing and ron paul literally was running up to that 2008 campaign and then you know subsequently the 2012 one and i got exposed to a whole new way of thinking um libertarianism that sort of ron paul libertarianism and um yeah look man it's been a journey and it's um i, I guess the first red pill is just to realize that um uh, we know nothing <laughs> unless we really research the crap out of it and um it's so easy to pat people on the back it's so easy to get inside your own little echo chamber and think that everybody else has the answers and you just have to rely on them until you realize you start digging, you realize most people are repeating slogans. And yeah, 2006 was 2006 was the time I was five years late to the party realizing well, or three years in the case of Iraq, uh, that it wasn't as virtuous as, uh, as I believed it was. And I've probably swallowed a good 120 tablets of uh, or red pills in that, <laughs> in that time so yeah uh, it's not easy to uh be in this uh, uh alt media scene because you know you do lose a uh, you know a lot of friendships you're you know saying uh, unpopular things but it's just it's 
uh, I, I, maybe it's a curse in a way that we're just driven to uh, pursue this because, you know, we do see that, you know, there's issues that need to be discussed. Mm. Yeah, look, I, it's funny because, like, we're talking about liberal arts and I was reflecting on this a little while ago. Um, I was in, a you know, a liberal arts program, okay, and even then there was obviously this staunch how do we put it, um, rebelliousness to being the only hard conservative in, in a bunch of like real rabid lefties, you know? Um, and, and I I think that streak has always run through what I've done. I'm not so much afraid to, I hate losing friends, but I'm not so afraid to sort of preach what I believe and, 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 and speak the truth as I see it. Um, I think the red pill moment though, that happens, um, it takes away your security blanket in a sense. It, it, it really makes you feel um, so insecure and lied to and, and betrayed and, and all of that. And I've seen red pill moments destroy people. Like I've seen them, you know, some people can handle them, some people can't. And it's not about strength or makeup, I don't think, but I think it's, it is quite catastrophic and it can lead to um, severe depression. Um, when something that you, 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 you'll see it with people who, join Protestantism or the Catholic Church or something like that after having, like, their whole family having been in one or the other. And, um, you know, that sense of being lied to your whole life um, is, is, is hard. And it makes you suspicious and it makes you sad. And, and yeah, look, it's, it's about how you use it. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, look, continue with your questions. But I really do think that um, Australia is way behind the eight ball on alt media. So you said 10 years ago, you know, who would have thought we'd be doing this? Um, anybody who's been observing geopolitics in, in, you know, this last decade or more has seen a huge awakening around, you know, thanks to the internet and thanks to uh, alt providers, for example, uh, giving news and information that otherwise would not have been accessible to the general public. And it has had significant change on populations. For me, it took me two years to pull my finger out um, because I quite literally um, was hoping somebody else would, would come along and do it for me. <laughs> um, and we are in Australia so far behind the eight ball when it comes to this sort of thing. So, yeah, look, if the best we can do is inspire half a dozen other far more articulate, intelligent people to take up the torch, that's okay with me. Now, your background's in uh, music, and people yes. watching the video can see the keyboard in the background. Uh, now, uh, okay. previously on this show, I've interviewed the, the Rational Rise, and James yep. Fox Higgins and Rob McMullen, they're both musicians. Mm -hmm. I've wondered, is there a you know, conservative, libertarian streak in the, the music industry that's just hidden? Um. That's a, that would be a big call for me to make. But one thing I have seen, the awakening from the far, far left to the far right, I, I, I've seen a lot. And there are quite a few people. I was talking to a gentleman, a very well-known uh, entertainer recently, who I won't out on the show. But um, he was he's just recently been exposed to Milo Yiannopoulos and Dr. Jordan Peterson. And as a hard lefty, it's been a real challenge for him. And we spent forever talking about that process of of um of recognizing the substructure of western civilization was based on something and it's been undone very very quickly and um you know there, there there's a, another gentleman I, who, who i won't who we just did a festival with recently and you know i joked about happy invasion day because he was playing an australia day show that we were doing and um and he started don't start with that shit and i realized very quickly how much of a conservative streak he sort of had in him. Um, uh, and nobody would know because they don't advertise it. And I, you know, I can say also that there are, you know, you and I disagree on the same sex marriage thing. But um, when I was sort of doing interviews on the, for the no campaign, like why I was voting no um, and exploring that subject, I have a lot of friends in the industry, for example, who voted yes straight away. I mean, it, as soon as the ballot paper came in, because that's what we're supposed to do. And as the campaign went on, um, they were telling me, oh my gosh, these radical LGBTQI Marxist collective people are scary. Uh, I think we made a mistake, you know. So 
there is something about the arts that is that is very different to just your normal university degree. And I was asked on a panel recently, like, why, of all the things I've done in life, why so much time in music? And I think it's just the bloody self-determination of the thing. And and so I, I do think we will see a lot more artists waking up um, and hopefully speaking up. But as you know, like, you and I can do this. Um, I, I can lose some endorsements. I can lose all that sort of stuff. That's fine. Um, some people out there, are, their whole bread and butter relies on towing a certain line and a certain way of being. And if they were to do today what we're doing today, um, it would be a career ender. Uh, and they would have the whole power of the mainstream media basically naming and shaming them. So um, I think it's going to take a little bit more of this. I, you know, I don't think the the boldness of institutions is necessarily going to change overnight in a country like Australia. I think, sadly, we're probably going to be relying on the next generation. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I do know conservatives in the industry. Um, some of them you'll see they'll out themselves on Facebook. But generally, it's private. It's private, much like the rest of the community, I guess. Now, through your YouTube channel, you were uh, quite involved in the uh, same-sex marriage campaign when we had the uh, postal survey. You interviewed uh, several yes. uh, people who uh, were advocating a, a no vote. Uh, why did you decide to get involved in the campaign? Wow. Okay, so I had a self-imposed deadline as to when I was going to start um, That Guy Media, um, and... Uh, it just happened in that same fortnight, same-sex marriage postal vote got announced. So it wasn't a planned, you know, uh, it wasn't a planned thing in a sense. But um, I guess it became important to me when over three dozen of my gay friends, um, okay, as a, as a libertarian and a cultural libertarian, my first thought was, look, hey, we live in a secular democracy. If Australians are going to vote that way, what's the deal? Um but I had over three dozen gay friends tap me on the shoulder telling me they were voting no in a very short space of time and that I should take it a lot more seriously because of the tentacles of cultural Marxism, CSE, which were, you know, safe schools programs, which we were told would not be uh, um, in the same ballpark as that uh, and was, um, that there were two leaked bills and both of them explained genderless marriage, not um, uh, male and male or female and female, um, and, you know, it, it really, re I wanted to explore the other side. Like, why why would gay guys, straight people, people who've been through this before, people in other countries who've suffered because of weaponized human rights commissions um, straight off the back of, of this, what happens to families? I just thought, let's explore the unpopular side because um, I only have to turn on Channel 10, Channel 7, you know, ABC uh, to get the yes campaign. And, uh, and, and that's that's sort of, the rabbit warren that I went down, um, looking at the unpopular truths and things attached to that that thing. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I just guess by, by virtue of the fact that we weren't getting a whole lot of no media um, in the mainstream media, I wanted to see how important this thing really was. And I came to the conclusion that it was extremely important to the substructure of, of, of Western civilization and... Um, because it was built off the back of nearly 40 years of cultural Marxism and activists that we, we weren't really aware were there until they started showing their faces. Most of them, let's use their language, you know, straight white and privileged uh, university leftists um, screaming loud. Most of my gay friends uh, didn't care at all. Uh, and, and I found that quite fascinating. <laughs> But Australia voted yes, uh, overwhelmingly, 61.6%. We now have um, same-sex marriage uh, legal. Um, I've, from my point of view, I felt it was a bit too much for people on the no side to say that, you know, everything uh, hinged on this, that, you know, if, if same-sex marriage became legal, then, you know, the cultural Marxist is one, because uh, where I live, it's it's pretty much middle Australia, and I wasn't surprised when, the, uh, from the conversations I had, that uh, it was an electorate that, that voted yes, and they voted yes, you know, not because, you know, they're, you know, 
influenced by cultural Marxists. Like if somebody came up to them and said, oh, we should, you know, abolish Australia Day or, you know, let all the boats in, they'd be, uh, you know, dead against that. Uh, so I really think that... Um, and also there was a lot of people, you know, active in the Yes campaign who aren't, you know, cultural Marxists. They were conservative, libertarian. Like, yes, there were the, the radical leftists who, you know, were, were pushing this, but I don't think it's a victory for them. They, they might claim it as their own. But also what I've noticed is that after, you know, they've claimed this victory, they've moved on to complaining about um, something else. So I, I don't think that, you know, the Yes vote is... You know, it's the um, disaster that s some were making out. It's it's happened. There's you know there there there's still a lot of you know other battles that can be won. Look, um, yeah, look, and I, I would I would politely disagree with you. I, I think what one of the statements you made is uh, that people weren't affected by cultural Marxism. I think anybody who's uh, basically grown up in our age bracket or you know ten years older are deeply affected by cultural Marxism and critical theory. I mean, that, that, that uh, and the intersectional nonsense that has basically become pervasive in all mainstream media, it's, a, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's in everything. It's in the way we speak about um, Indigenous Australia, about immigrants, about any subject. It, there's, a, there's, a, there's a critical theory nature to everything that we read and touch nowadays in Australia. So... Um, and look, in terms of how it plays out, look, one of the reasons that we're doing what we're doing is that I wanted to get ahead of what I would call the alt-white in Australia. There are certain um, alternative pundits out there that are very white nationalistic in their, in their Richard Spencer style uh, monologues. And I thought they cannot win. They cannot win. They, they can't be the ones representing alternative news in Australia because otherwise it'll be over before it even begins. Um, but, you know, I, I think the reality is only, I can't remember what I was going to say about that, but only time will tell what's going to happen. What's going to happen. Um, because if you look at Canada and Bill C-16, if you look at what happens in any con country where the biological um, parent is changed to legal parent, you look at how people talk about and educate things. Like if you've studied safe schools and um, the global CSE agenda, you'll be completely aware that things that mature adults could discuss and probably wouldn't um, are being shoved down the necks of a lot of children right now. A lot of the scary, scary things that uh, we're looking at with cultural Marxism in Australia are going to be all that much harder to wind back now uh, same-sex marriage is being legalised. Because we've got to remember it's not same-sex marriage. It's genderless marriage. Okay, so for me, if it was male and male or female and female, it wouldn't have been as scary. But we have passed in Parliament now in the same, like within 24 hours, zero legal protections for um, people of uh, all top five major religions have a problem with gay marriage. Uh, there's no religious protections from them. There's no conscientious objections. Uh, there is no ability to, to be able to voice your opinions in the open uh, if you disagree. And, you know, five million Australians is, is, is nothing to be sneezed at, by the way. Um, to me, that's the biggest concern. It's not whether or not you know, um, two lesbians or two gay guys can get married. It's whether or not you disagree with that, you're allowed to say anything about it. Um, so, look, time will tell how this will play out. Uh, I think unlike a lot of countries, though, like Ireland, like Canada, we actually have precedent. And again, what I was going to say is the reason we do this, rather than just replaying international uh, alt media shows all day, every day, is because Australians speak a very different language. We weren't born in civil war. We weren't born in uh, a revolution, okay? We have a very different vernacular in the way we communicate. And even though the principles are the same, you know, maybe things won't get as bad as they have across Canada and across Europe and the United States. Maybe the intersectionality and the division won't be as bad. Maybe free speech will be protected um, somehow. But 
you know, I don't see it. I don't see it. Because I can tell you from a lot of my gay friends who, who, who I speak to, they did not want transgender people represented with them. They didn't want to be lumped in with the, with this Marxist collective of LGBTQI+. They're just gay guys who love their partners or gay girls who love their partners. So, yeah. Look, I, I do think it's... I do think we... If this last 90 days did anything... It probably educated people about subjects that they had no idea about to begin with. And I think Australians are probably going to be very much more acutely aware of where to from here. And I hope we don't go the way of Canada, for example. So, yeah, let's see. We'll just see. <laughs> well, well, for me, it's it, because, you know, there may be these other issues that may come up in the future. It wasn't enough for me to say... Oh, sorry, you know, you can't, you know, do that. You can't have a wedding because, you know, there's all, there's these future uh, possibilities. It's, uh, it, for me, the, the vote was still about, you know, same-sex marriage. That's, that, that's all, all that it was about. And yes, like, I, like you, do share concerns about, you know, freedom of speech, conscientious object, uh, objectors, mm -hmm. but they're all, you know, s separate issues. Like I'm, I, I try to look at issues on their merits and objectively impos as possible. And I think that's what the majority of uh, Australians did. And, you know, I think they're, they're definitely going to do, do, do you think, do you think the majority of Australians did? You, you don't think the majority of Australians voted emotionally? No, I, th I think, think they looked at it. I think they just looked at look, looked at the the question on its own. If there if there is you know going to be you know in five years time you know uh, attacks on free speech or you know even more uh, a more radical version of safe schools, I, I you know I doubt that you know the Australian people are going to you know just accept that. Well, okay, four years ago they accepted it though, and and, and this is. This is the thing. One thing I think this... Okay, so Safe Schools was snuck in under the cover of night as an anti-bullying program. And just like a lot of CSE programs around the world, they're snuck in as uh, anti-pregnancy programs, anti-domestic violence programs, you know, anti-bullying programs and things like that. And it's not till a couple of years later that the public realise there's radical gender theory being taught to their young children uh, that they get really frustrated. So, look, I, I think... If this plebiscite did anything, it exposed people to a huge amount of issues that have been snuck in under the cover of night activists and ivory tower intellectuals who have been operating from La Trobe University and others, for example. Um, they, they, they've been exposed to things that they didn't know existed before. So, you know, good came out of it, in a sense. Um, but yeah, look, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to disagree. I, I, think, I think at the end of the day, um, we have precedent in every other country, the other 24 countries that have actually done this, where human rights commissions have been weaponized to anybody who has any um, disagreement, uh, conscientious objection to um, uh, gay marriage. Just, just call it that, right? Uh, that in and of itself needs to be protected because all top five major religions in the world won't change their position just because the state said so. And I think you are going to see a lot of the same horrible activists who start raising hell for religious institutions, um, demanding that they should be married in a church, demanding that they should be able to use any service that they, that they should so desire. And I think you're going to see a bunch of test cases unfold next year, which will um, probably make Australians think twice about what we did. Because it wasn't about Okay, we were presented, should same-sex couples be allowed to marry? That was the ballot paper. Sure, absolutely, why not? That's how most Australians voted. What they didn't vote for was the bill that passed. They didn't vote for genderless marriage. They didn't vote for transgender marriage. Okay, that postal survey did not say anything about transgender marriage. And anybody who um, realises that gender dysphoria is actually a, a psychological issue, like... Uh, any psychologist worth their medal. Um, you know, I, I, I really think that is a profound difference to what the Australians were asked to vote on. So, you know, I, I think we're going to be watching. We're going to be watching very closely. And this is not out to hurt my gay friends at all. In fact, I probably conferred to them far more than um, I would any other 
identity group um, that I was talking to because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't pushing too hard too far <laughs> and too early. Um, you know, and they were saying, go for it, go for it. You know, no, this is what, this is fine. Well, you know, we're not offended by your speech. And, you know, this, this, this is going to be an interesting year ahead, I think, for test cases. So we may disagree on that, but let's wait and see how it plays out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm still, you know, optimistic about the uh, Australian people. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be, you know, out here because it's because it's not just me doing this. It's not just to convince people. It's also, you know, to give you know other Australians a voice as well. And you know, based on uh, the the feedback that I receive, and also based on you know other polls that I've seen on other issues. And if there's one thing we learnt from the same sex marriage. Uh, Postal survey is that the polls are right. The the Australian people will def, uh, definitely you know rally to defend against you know anything anything else that the the cultural left uh, try to throw at us. Yeah, yeah, and, and more more so now than the last forty years. And so that's the positive that came out of the same sex marriage thing. I think people really got to see you know like it was amazing to go to, to be a part of the Milo event watching you know, three and a half thousand Australians basically from 12 to 91 flock around Milo and it, and just from all backgrounds of all walks of life, just sick and tired of the nanny state, the progressive left, the cultural Marxism that has just permeated every institution to the mainstream media, to the universities. It was an incredible thing to behold. And um, it heartened me. And you're right, this is not about two guys just talking and, and trying to convince the world. This is about, to me, I see myself as an explorer. And uh, anybody who's been red-pilled and realized that they re we really don't know that much. You know, the only way to really know is to study the life out of something and not take it off the back of a slogan. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think Australians are waking up. But they're waking up very differently to other countries as well. And it's... Um, that's what all of this is about. It's it's about exploring issues together. Like George Carlin said, well, you know, let's paraphrase. If I say to my wife, do you want to go for coffee? If there's 26 locations within four blocks of my house to coffee, then how many more solutions to love and economics and war and, and all the rest? You know, um, I'm, I'm so tired of the two party, the two newspapers, the two, you know, the left, the right divided. It's it's all false. It's all a false paradigm. And Australians are waking up to that. Now, as we established earlier, uh, uh, this, uh, what you're advocating now is not uh, how, how what you advocated when you originally uh, entered politics. And I have to say that, you know, I, I'm the, the same, you know, I came from a pretty standard, you know, libertarian uh, free market background. But what led me to, you know, this, you know, trying to, you know, battle the, uh, as I call it, you know, the regressive left and the, the cultural Marxist is, is basically them trying trying to uh, uh, basically say that our whole society was, you know, based on, you know, oppression and privilege, because I'd grown up in, you know, the 90s and 2000s, and uh, I was lucky to go to school during this time because, you know, uh, we were uh, we were basically brought up that, you know, things like, you know, racism and, you know, sexism, they're, you know, a thing of the past, you know, it was terrible, you know, what happened. But the great thing about, you know, our society today is that we've overcome it. But uh, in uh, probably 2015, uh, 2016, it began on the, the US university campuses where, uh, you know, all these students started saying, no, there's this, you know, inherent racism in everything. There's, and then there's this term, you know, casual racism. There's, you know, uh, uh, microaggressions. Yeah, pa yeah. The, the, the patriarchy still, you know, dominates the society. Even if you think you're the most tolerant person ever, there's, you know, you're, you're programmed to oppress people. And it was just like, what? That is insane. And it was, it's basically summed up well by uh, Anita Sarkeesian when she basically said that, you know, everything's racist, everything's sexist, everything is homophobic. And uh, it just really, I, uh, uh, you know, scared me that these people were trying to tear down, you know, our society that, you know, the, the sort of new, um, you know, harmonious society that we had and really, you know, divide us again. And as we saw in 2016 with, you know, riots in major US cities, it, you know, was really quite 
dangerous as well. And, you know, we really needed to start start to push back against that. That was the, that became the biggest issue for me as sort of, you know, the, um, you know, reducing the tax rate from, you know, 30 to 25 cent that can, you know, wait a few years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think, you know, there's a combination of things that, that, that created this. I mean, obviously, we've had the, the ivory tower cultural Marxists who've just been winked at and seen as some sort of aberration. You know, if you're a, a pedophile apologist or something, uh, you know, you've got a thesis on why, um, you know, like Peter Singer, uh, you know, will write something on, you know, why a child should be killed, be allowed to be killed up to two or three years after birth, because they can't sustain their own life. And, you know, you have other theses out there on things like, you know, basically once you've left the working age, you're no longer a tax-paying useful citizen, um, you know, really outrageous things on whether or not we should consider, you know, state-mandated euthanasia. I mean, all this sort of stuff has sort of always been seen as an aberration, you know what I mean? Not not actually the stuff, the meat and potatoes of, of, of what enters the university circuit. And most parents... Um, from the 80s onwards, institutionalized their children very early so they could have it all, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, like uh, so they could have their second mortgage and and uh, and the extra car. And they kind of left, basically, most parents left their kids to the state to be educated. Um, I mean, A, that's a very Marxist, Marxist uh, utopia in and of itself. But because I think a lot of people have had their eyes shut and cotton balls in their ears for the last, you know, 36 odd years, um, certain agendas have been promoted that have, uh, with billions and billions of dollars worth of marketing behind them, and they've been seen as as new and cool and and groovy, and you know we're always at the cutting edge of uh, uh, the bleeding edge of, of of intellectual thought when we come up with these things. They're not new ideas, man. You know, from from the safe school CSC stuff. I mean, this is Frankfurt School stuff. This is back in the twenties and thirties, for goodness sake. I mean, uh, this is not something that is um, new. It's not something that is. Uh, it's just something that we thought we'd beat in World War Two, and it was never coming back, and we just weren't watching. In these times, like from the 60s to the 80s, say feminism became big business, like big industry. And you've got to realize a lot of these, these cultural Marxist institutions actually require um, victims to, to continue to continue to get funding. And so we've seen this breakdown, um, what, what we would call a breakdown of uh, uh, intellectual honesty um, is because we're always looking for victims. So it's the, we've, we're literally down to the point of microaggressions and, and uh, you know, um, subconscious bias and, and, and all of this horror. Um, 30 years ago, if you had have suggested that people would be taking sensitivity training programs for making an off-color remark in the workplace, people would, they wouldn't believe you. They wouldn't believe you. But this is um, this is what's required if these big industries are to continue. <laughs> and um, it's it's sick. It's disgusting. And the irony is, okay. So my viewership, like like a lot of alt viewerships, is pretty well thirteen to twenty six. Massive gap, fifty five plus. And so it's generally the uh, the baby boomers and the middle aged people who realize they're stuffed up somewhere along the way. And it's the rebels in the Gen Zs, not the millennials, sadly, um, en masse, but the Gen Zers who are rebelling. Because, again, it's, 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 a, um, it's a protest. It's a protest. So once upon a time, we may have been far more left. Okay, so if we had a nanny state telling you what you can read, what you can watch, what you can say, what you can and what you can't, um, generally it was the left that was defending free speech from those uh, cultural nannies, from that nanny state. Now, uh, the only ones seeming to be talking about uh, the defense of free speech, which took us 1,200 years to get to, and which was the way we were able to overcome things like racism, sexism, and, and, and you know, horrors of the past. Um, have, have been the conservatives or libertarians. And so, you, you know, the pendulum always has to swing back. You know, if we had an EMP or a nuclear war right now, what's going to happen? We're going to go back to mother, father, child. Okay, we're going to go back to the things that history has always survived on. Um, and economically conservative principles just uh, are, are, usually, are usually the things that, that are birthed 
after mass catastrophes. We don't generally see um, these very privileged individuals. And you look at the numbers, you look at the numbers of the people marching, screaming, yelling, ranting about sexism and racism, and they're generally fairly well-off white kids who uh, have never really worked a day in their life or suffered hard. Um, so, yeah, look, this intersectionality is evil. It needs to be fought. It's very easily fought, um, but we, yeah, it, it's very easily fought with, with clever arguments and uh, with common sense. But we just, the number one thing, the number one thing, and excuse me, I'm so tired, but the number one thing um, that inspires me constantly is that J Dr. Jordan Pearson talking about telling the truth. Okay, so we have this very nihilistic view in the world about um, this very victim mentality about who we are. Um, but he says, you're not a speck of dust in seven billion. You know, forget that idea. Forget nihilism. You are actually a node in a network, which means, you know, a thousand people. Okay, which means you're one person away from a million, two people away from a billion. So don't underestimate the power of your speech tell your truth it will form you it will shape you state your mode of being in the world and it will change everything i think and i was there and you were there i remember very very clearly from being a child where people were you had the bob hawks and you had the, that sort of era of politics um very quickly become very sanitized in this whole you can't say that phenomena for fear of offending people seemed to happen overnight and um i i just think People don't realize how powerful they are. They don't realize that you don't have to remain a victim. The whole sum of your life and your achievements generally are brought about because of your own efforts and your own actions. And sure, you know, there are disadvantaged people in society, but it's not everyone, you know, and I, I, think, I think we are in a really blessed country and we are in a really blessed uh, culture and civilization that uh, sadly a lot of these millennials don't understand they're fighting shadows they're fighting with gnats it's it's not going to last it's not going to last and they're not going to wind up happy individuals um come middle age either i think that it started when the the berlin wall came down because that was the end of uh, communism, Marxism as an economic system, and so the uh, the, uh, the the Marxist uh, lobby in the the West they were feeling really demoralised on that. But how do we, you know, push our ideas now? And that's when they came up with this idea of cultural Marxism. So okay, you know, we can't you know yeah. have the you know the proletariat over overthrow the government anymore. Uh, what we've got to do is basically. Mm. Uh, you know, deconstruct the the culture, and you know, have seen that with the attacks on you know Australia Day on on Australian history, and uh, and like we mentioned before, with you know creating all these you know victim groups to basically say that the way our society is is structured, it's it's based on you know not economic oppression, but you know personal oppression, and yeah, like you mentioned that the these people like all throughout history, the it's systemic, you know, yeah, yeah. the you know Marxists and the Fabian socialists, they've all been uh, intellectuals, you know, they've all been you know people who've been brought up in. Uh, you know, uh, privilege. And, uh, of course, it, it, it's always ironic that, you know, with their talk about, you know, um, you know, male, uh, male privilege and white privilege, it's like, for, uh, for example, they always, they always leave behind the fact that, you know, most homeless people, are, you know, are white men. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the facts don't lie. And look, if, if I honestly thought that this was a thing, um, I'd be there, right? I mean, I'm happy to have my mind changed, show me the numbers. But, what we're seeing is a lot, a lot, a lot of um, victim narrative, victim culture. Um, and, you know, they're invading on everybody else's lives. This this, this guilt that is, you know, like Corey Bernardi says, you know, conservatism at its best is standing on the shoulders of giants so that you may see further. And that's so you don't make the mistakes of the past. You build on the best that you've got. Critical theory is in and of itself uh, a, a, a system of thought that everything old is bad and everything new and progressive is good. And it's always throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, and Dr. Jordan Peterson says something very interesting about that. He was talking about the Tower of Babel and self-limiting systems and things. And one, one of the interesting things is 
all of these people who were told that they're so powerful and important and intelligent and, you know, every child gets a trophy basically um, in universities all have an idea about how to save the world. He said, start by cleaning your room for goodness sake. And secondly, start by trying to change a close family member or friend. You know, they drink too much. They swear too much. They do something that is offensive. And he said, you're going to get blowback. It's really, really hard to change somebody else. Like sometimes impossible. You know, but if you can't do that two or three times, who the hell are you to think that you can actually have a theory that is going to work for all of civilization? Everybody's got one. Reality is they get to run rampant these theories through universities untested because it usually takes at least 20 years, if not, you know, two generations or three generations before there's any blowback for that stupid idea. Um, we can change, we can at best affect change with the people in our lives. But it has to start with us, and then it starts with the neighbours, and it starts with the people in your very life. And if you're not practising what you preach there, for goodness sake, stop writing thesis on how you're going to change the world, or, or um, you've got a replacement for Western civilization, which is far better. I, I just think there's a lot of sociopathy, a lot of narcissism, um, mixed with victimhood and, uh, and and intersectionality, which has just created this beast, and it's been allowed to run rampant quietly for a long time. Now it's coming in; it's rearing its uh, ugly head in public. Um, yeah, it's become laughable. There's, it's, become laughable. it's not just ideas uh, now. Uh, now that you know are being you know forced on you know people, especially uh, young people. It's now it's now become you know vi- a real life violence and intimidation. It's it's not just you know you're you know being taught you know a warped view of the world. It's just if you don't agree with that, you know we're going to if we can beat you to a pulp. That's right. But, that, but see, that's, that's the logical extension of, of if you think, if you actually, I don't know if you saw that Steve Crowder, um, I believe there are only two genders changed my mind sort of thing. And you listen to the people coming up to him on the street and say, so why do you think they're, uh, sorry, this is at university. And, you know, they're saying, you know, so I believe uh, gender is what you feel it is. Okay. Okay. So why do you believe that? And he said, what if I, I choose not? Because in, in a legal framework, how are we supposed to operate a society in this sense? Um, oh, you know, well, it'll operate fine if you, you know, treat people's feelings as all equal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, okay, um, what if I choose not to use your um, preferred pronoun? He said, well, that, that would be violence. And he said, well, that would be a crime. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying it's a crime. I'm just saying it would be violence. And you go, but the law defines what violence is. You know what I mean? So there are a lot of very confused, fractured individuals out there at the moment. But the reality is, if they feel violated, if they feel like they are victims of violence, and you keep telling these kids that they're victims of violence because you use the wrong language around them, um, the natural response to them, to that person, is to commit violence back. That is no framework for civilization. Um... You know, what is it? Shapiro always says, you know, the uh, the facts don't care about your feelings. And that's why we have to keep exploring these things and, and trying to expose other people to. There's nothing harder than watching a glazed eyed uh, lefty who just cannot, cannot, cannot think for themselves. Um, so we need to find ways of red pilling them very, very quickly. <laughs> As I stated before, the the reason that I'm doing this is well, two reasons. Because you know, I want to give you know uh, Australians who you know believe the things that I do, uh, you know, a voice and and give them the the confidence that you know they're they're not alone and that they can you know take part in the the fight back as well. But there's also uh, a lot of other Australians who you know just live their daily lives who aren't engaged in this. Where to use your favourite term, we uh, basically need to. To red pill them, uh, and so pre- as so that's the the second part of you know what we're trying to achieve: red pilling uh, the masses. And 
Uh, like I said before, I do believe that a lot of Australians are already on our side. I mean, uh, you know, eighty-five percent of Australians support Australia Day. Uh, there was that poll a year ago which said that you know forty-nine percent of Australians wanted to uh, ban Muslim immigration. Uh, you know, some uh, on the right do think that goes a bit far, but it you know shows that you know the Australian people they are concerned about you know the immigration uh, system and, you know, making sure that, you know, we have a, a nation that is socially cohesive. So there, there's the, uh, yes. the, the public is, you know, there to, um, you know, uh, have their voices heard. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's one thing to, you know, get, uh, get them to, you know, make some noise, but it's also another thing to then translate that noise to influencing the, the political class because, the you know the politicians in both major parties they say you know no there's you know nothing wrong with you know laws against free speech you know there's there, there there's nothing wrong with our you know immigration system uh, as it is you know uh, uh, climate change you know we're still going to have all this uh, renewable energy that there, there seems to be still this massive disconnect where people feel let down by our political class but they keep voting them back in yeah absolutely and I think most of it has to do with the fact that we've relied so heavily for generations on the idea that um, politics is a solution. Okay, you, you don't start. Nothing works top down in, the, in that in that um, socio political sense. It has to be a genuine will of the people. And I think the whole idea of you know that's the government's job to do this or the government's job to do that. You know, we deserve A, B, C because it's the government's job. I mean, again, that's very anti libertarian idea, but I think that's the trap that a lot of Australians have fallen into. The government will fix it for us, not we'll fix it for ourselves. But I think, you know, I, I think people are waking up to the fact that that's just not a reality. Um, you're right. I think Australians uh, generally um, are endowed with common sense. You know, I, I, I genuinely think that they have been made to feel insignificant and inferior by a very loud, very well-funded machine, um, uh, mostly uh, comprised of, of, of leftists and, 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 and cultural Marxists, that present a narrative of the world or a narrative of our country that isn't actually so. And they've played on a lot of guilt and a lot of you know past horrors and, and things that we've done in the past. They've uh, rewritten history books to basically make things look a certain way and... And, you know, I think there's been a real breakdown in the generations. Like, we don't listen to our grandparents anymore and about their, you know, what they went through. We generally don't speak to people too much younger than us. I do see a coming together happening at the moment. So in terms of red pilling the masses, as, as you, you're saying there, I think, first of all, lead by example. I don't do parents well, um, though I am one. And, and, and one, of the, one of the things I've... I'm getting better at it. One of the things I find fascinating at, you know, four, five-year-old birthday parties and things like that is, you know, we'll talk about a subject and I'm listening to people speak in hushed tones. So you talk about safe schools, for example. Um, and the majority of parents are deeply uncomfortable by the idea that their, their child may be actually taught masturbation with dildos and sex toys uh, in a classroom environment by a 45-year-old. You know, that, that, that makes them deeply uncomfortable at a, at a maternal or paternal level. And they speak in hushed tones and all that sort of stuff. And I love drawing it out. I love drawing it out. And the moment you encourage them that they're not alone, that other people think that way too, um, on, any, on any subject, you know, um, it, it, it really gives me a lot of pleasure. And I do see a lot more of that happening. But I do think we have to lead by example. You know, a lot of people who otherwise thought they were alone and were the only people who'd ever heard of Milo Yiannopoulos um, met at these events, for example, uh, and they realized, oh, my gosh, so I'm not the only person in Australia who's heard of this guy. You know, um, I'm not the only person in Australia who doesn't believe the narrative that is a Nazi and a white supremacist and all that sort of stuff, and he's actually got a few sensible things to say. Um, you know, I, I, I think... We just need more of that. And Australians will do it themselves. I think the she'll be right attitude um, that has pervaded Australian society for a long, long time is drying up. Um, the far left don't think she'll be right. 
they're always on a, on a march. They've always got an agenda. And I think Australians are only in recent days been waking up to that agenda. And I think, you know, it's going to be war. It's going to be war. Um, we just have to remind them that they are powerful, that everybody is powerful. Okay. And it's not about changing the world. It's about changing their world. Uh, I definitely feel, and this, uh, this is always the case in other countries, that things have got to get a whole lot worse for people to, you know, really, you know, engage and revolt. Um, you know, I have people look in admiration, for example, at, you know, what's going on in, you know, Poland and Hungary. You know, they're really, uh, the people there, are, yeah. you know, have really wanted to, you know, defend Western civilization, you know, their, their, their values. But the reason why they've, they've got that attitude is because they suffered under 45 years of communism. Uh, and so, and so, yeah. so it sort of made me wonder, like, is that what we have to, uh, you know, go through to, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, we, you know, have, have an appreciation and, you know, make sure we want to, you know, defend uh, our way of life. But I, I definitely do think, well, as we've seen this year after, you know, we, there was the euphoria of 2016 with, you know, Brexit and Trump, but this year has been, you know, it's, it's, it's been quite demoralising. But yes, it's, it's definitely going to get, you know, a lot, a lot worse. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, that's when, uh, you know, we need to make sure that when that time, you know, happens, when, you know, it, it, it does become, you know, uh, intense that, you know, the Australian people are ready to, you know, f uh, fight back and say, because uh, I mentioned politicians before, like, uh, it, it, like they, they do listen to, you know, too much the, you know, the cultural lead and the intelligentsia, but, you know, they are still shit scared of the people and the voters. And if they receive like, you know, a thousand phone calls in a day saying, you know, what you're doing is disgusting, like, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll freak out and, you know, cha uh, ch change their uh, position. Yeah, look, I don't, I don't think the current staple of them are scared enough of the people, to be honest, okay? I, I Because they're mostly bipartisan on the things that, that really matter um, against the interests of Australians, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I genuinely think that um, it, it, it's not tick box A or B, as, as we discussed before. There are many, many, many different solutions to, to a problem. And we're so used to just looking at box A or B and, the, you know, the little green C every now and again. Uh, that, that's not the way the world works. And I, I think people are realizing that arguments are far more nuanced, that just slogans um, aren't the answer. Uh, there are so many ways of looking at things. Yes, we have the blessing of being able to look around the world at, you know, Poland, Hungary, and you can also look at the horrors of the socialist world um, sweeping across, you know, United States uh, in some states over there where George Soros's Black Lives Matter and Antifa are, are just causing hell uh, across Chicago and the like. Well, but again, most people generally, I, I think sadly you're right, things are going to get a little bit darker before they get lighter, if not a lot darker before they get lighter. And it's that suffering that's going to motivate. So most of us who have been red-pilled, um, it's happened because of an event in our lives that was hard, it was horrible, okay? And, and some people lose their health, and so they have time to read again instead of just watch television, and they realize, oh, my gosh, history. I forgot about that. And, and they, you know, it's always the historians, it's always the artists, it's always the ones uh, sort of that don't, that, that use another side of their brain that are the first ones to start questioning wars, why we need to go to this war, why we need to vote on this policy. You know what I mean? And I think, I think Australia is in for a, a bit more darkness before, before it gets lighter. But I think that darkness is uh, at least the Brexit to Trump thing. And, you know, what we saw on both sides of the same sex marriage campaign and the lengths people were willing to go to, uh, put forth their side. Um, it does give me hope that there is going to be a, a lot more social activism, in a sense, into the future uh, from all camps as things get darker. And, yeah, if there's one thing that we've seen over and over again, we have a good thing here in Australia and uh, we don't want to spoil it. We don't want to spoil it. We, want, we don't want to go the way of Germany. You know, we don't want to go the way of uh, some parts of Italy at the moment. We don't want to go the way of really socialist countries that have uh, totally undermined the fabric of their Western civilizations. Um, so, yeah, 
we just have to keep talking that and encouraging, granting people the courage to speak because speech is powerful and, and we have to defend free speech at all costs. It costs us too much to get and it could be undone in one generation if we are not vigilant. Well, we're certainly uh, going to both keep up the fight. So I've enjoyed our chat today, Luke. We'll, we'll keep in contact for sure and we'll definitely uh, appear on air again sometime soon. God bless. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The Unshackled does not go on holidays, so we'll be here right up until Christmas and through the new year, so please stick around. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.